Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Success Factors in Your Investigational New Drug Filing. My name is Vicki and I will be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for 60 minutes with time for a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speaker throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance at any time, please contact me by using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. And at this point, I would like to thank Regis Technologies, who helped develop the content for this presentation. Regis Technologies, Inc., a Chicago-based CMO, focuses on small molecule active pharmaceutical ingredients and partners with pharmaceutical companies to expedite drugs to the clinic and ultimately to the market. They offer synthesis, analytical, and separation services to advance your API from initial process development to final validation and commercial manufacturing. Let their veteran project managers successfully guide your molecule through the IND and NDA processes. Regis Technologies operates an FDA inspected CGMP facility with about 36,000 square feet of production space, housing eight reactor suites from 25 to 500 gallons. New for 2015, Regis Potent Compound Suite, PCS, is qualified and ready for projects. The PCS edition allows Regis to serve the oncology market by providing for small molecule CGMP manufacturing of potent compounds up to about one kilogram per batch. And now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Our first speaker is Jennifer Stanick. Jennifer is the Director of Global Regulatory Affairs, CMC at Takeda. She has over 20 years experience in key roles within CMC regulatory affairs, formulation development and analytical development. Jennifer began her career at GD Searle and also has done CMC consulting. And our next speaker is Dan Weissmuller. Dan is the director of quality at Regis Technologies. Over the past 15 years, Dan has developed experience and expertise in analytical development, process and analytical validation, IND support to Regis's custom API customers, drug master file, regulatory approvals worldwide, and FDA inspections. Dan is in the process of completing his master's in quality regulatory sciences from Northwestern University. And finally, our last speaker for today's event is Steve Pondell. Steve is the vice president of CMC at ESSA Pharmaceuticals. With over 30 years in the industry, he is a CMC expert in the manufacturing, compliance, and regulatory aspects of product development from manufacturing, from clinical manufacturing through global regulatory approvals and into commercial production. And now, before we begin, we have a quick poll question for the audience. And the poll question has, be has been launched on your screen. And the question is, what is your experience in filing an IND? And the answers we have today are none, limited, or considerable slash multiple filed. So please, if the audience could get their answers in right away. And the question is, what is your experience in filing an IND? And once again, the answers we have are none, limited experience, or considerable or multiple filed. And I will be closing this poll question and sharing the results with the audience. And 24% of the audience voted for none, 55% of the audience voted for limited experience, and 20% of the audience voted for considerable or multiple INDs filed. And now, without further ado, I will be passing over control to Jennifer. whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Vicki. Let me get back. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Vicki, and thank you to uh, Xtox and Regis for inviting me to share my experience and knowledge of USIND's in this webinar. Uh, my name is Jennifer Stanek, and I'm currently uh, Director in the Global Regulatory Affairs CMC Group at Takeda. The title of my presentation is Regulatory Considerations in Preparing uh, for the U.S. Investigational New Drug Application, or more commonly known as the IND. Um, I hope the audience finds uh, my presentation informative. Uh, just a few notes before I get into the meat of the presentation. My emphasis is on the CMC, or Chemistry Manufacturing and Control section. I will, on, I will touch on other parts, but um, my background is um, very much focused on the CMC area. And also, I just want to note that um, most of my presentation is really geared for opening your IND at the phase one stage. There are um, instances where you may open your IND at phase two or phase three stage, uh, but my focus here is when you're opening the IND at the phase one stage. So your road to opening the US IND. I divided the activities up here um, more by internal activities and then activities that you will accomplish with the FDA. So internally, there is a lot of activity going on in different departments within the company. Uh, there is drug substance um, development, and Dan will go into a little bit more of that. There's formulation development, which Steve will go into a little bit more, um, as well as analytical development. There are also a lot of preclinical studies, uh, toxicology studies, um, planning for the clinical protocol that are all ongoing in parallel. You will be preparing for a pre-IND meeting with the FDA if you desire an IND meeting with the, with the FDA. And then, of course, there's preparation of the initial IND. And all of this, the development activities and all these preparations are, are really going on in parallel. So it's a very active time um, for the company. Um, pr the preparation of the initial IND involves really a cross-functional team. It would include such areas as regulatory affairs, um, all your different CMC groups, uh, preclinical groups, uh, clinical groups, submissions management, particularly if you're doing electronic submissions and publishing, medical writing, you may need stats involvement, et cetera. So it's, um, it's a company-wide uh, initiative to, to get to your initial IND. So some of the activities that you will do with the, I, with the FDA during this phase um, is you, you would request and hold a pre-IND meeting, again, if you think it's necessary. This type of meeting is what the FDA calls a type B meeting. Uh, you typically discuss at this meeting safety data and your initial clinical protocol. So you, you may want to discuss with them if you have some concerns or if you just want to confirm with the FDA that the animal models you used or the first dose that you're proposing um, are acceptable to, to the FDA. You do also at this meeting have the opportunity, opportunity to discuss CMC data. In my experience, this hasn't um, happened a lot, but you may have a particular, particular concern around an impurity, maybe a genotoxic impurity, or a solvent that you need to use early in the process. And if you want to bring that information to the FDA uh, sooner than later, then this would be your opportunity to, to do that. Uh, there is guidance from the FDA on type B meetings. And it, this guidance is very detailed. It, it includes the format of your meeting request and the format of the briefing document and the timing of when all of this needs to happen. So for a pre-IND meeting, as soon as you request the meeting, they will grant a meeting within 60 days of that, of that request. So you need to make sure you, you time it appropriately um, because then your briefing document will need to be to the FDA within four weeks of that meeting. So at the time of your meeting request, you need to know what types of questions you're going to want to pose to the agency, who from the agency you, you want to attend your meeting, um, details like that. So you need quite a bit of information before you even request the meeting. And then you need to make sure that four weeks before granting of that meeting that you will have all of your background information compiled in a nice format 
um, ready for FDA review. So you need to be careful about the timing of this. There are other opportunities to meet with the FDA, but they are limited. Um, FDA does not want to have three pre-IND meetings with you, so you need to really make sure you're ready. Um, but if you um, are, for some reason, put on clinical hold or you have a dispute resolution uh, that needs to occur, those are what they call a type A meeting. Again, type A meetings are outlined in this guidance document. Those, due to the more um, urgent nature, are scheduled within 30 days of the request, but then your briefing document is due um, within two weeks of, of the meeting. There's also another kind of catch-all type C meeting. Those uh, don't need to be scheduled, or the FDA has 75 days to schedule those meetings. Um, and then the briefing document would be due four weeks ahead of that meeting. Um, the meeting request, you can request a face-to-face -face meeting or a teleconference, uh, but that's why you need to put your questions down at the time of the meeting request. The FDA will either accept the meeting request face-to-face -face, or they may say, well, we'll meet with you, but we want it to be a teleconference, um, just so they get an idea of where they need to spend their resources and is this really necessary um, to have this meeting. And then at the end of the day, obviously, you want to be able to submit your IND. It's typically submitted in the common technical document format, CTD. Um, most companies these days are, are submitting them in electronic format. You must submit your first initial IND at least 30 days before the start of the planned clinical study to give the FDA opportunity to, to review. At this point, their review is really going to be for safety concerns. Um, and you must receive a study may proceed letter from the FDA in order to start to start dosing um, your first in human studies. And this is called your IND activation date. With the study may proceed letter, you may also get additional requests for information. Um, that doesn't mean you can't start your study. It just means they wanted further clarification on a few items. I have seen CM I have seen CMC questions at this point. Um, if you've neglected to submit something like the COA or they have more questions on your justification for a couple of impurities, but they don't think it's um, critical enough that it's a safety issue, they'll just request that information. However, if they do have a um, significant safety concern for whatever reason, it could be related to tox, it could be related to something in the synthesis, an impurity, um, you may receive a clinical hold letter. And I'm sorry I didn't put that on my slide, but um, that's obviously an outcome that nobody, nobody wants. So I'm going to quickly go through um, the format of the US IND, and I will touch on some sections more than I touch on others. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the CTD format. It's modules one through five. Um, module one is um, kind of the administrative section. So here is where we house the FDA forms, the cover letter, um, environmental analysis. Usually for an early phase one study, you can claim a categorical exclusion. Uh, the general investigational plan, at this point, it should be really high level. Uh, you're going in with your first in human studies. If you gave further detailed clinical studies through phase three, it's probably not going to hold um, that long, you'll be getting data from all of your studies throughout that will likely change uh, the, the look of your clinical plan. Uh, there's an investigator's brochure that's primarily a summary of, of the information um, that you will put in your IND in Module 2, which I'll get to, but this is for the investigator. Since they don't have access to the IND, here's a document you can provide to them um, to give them background information on, on the investigational drug. And then finally, the investigational drug label, how you're going to label um, the drug that's going into the clinic. Then the Module 2 section is all summary sections. Uh, module 2.3 is the quality overall summary. So this is where the CMC summary information is. There are actually three subparts to this, the uh, 2.3i, which is the introduction, 2.3s, which is for drug substance, and 2.3p, which is for uh, the drug product. There's also Module 2.4, which is the non-clinical overview. 
Section 2.5 would be a clinical overview. At this point, you probably won't have anything in this section unless you did some clinical studies outside of the U.S. that you would need to summarize here. Uh, 2.6 is um, non-clinical written and tabulated summaries. And then Module 2.7, again, a clinical summary only as needed. So then if we get into Module 3, uh, module 3.2.S is the drug substance section. I listed here some minimum requirements. As many of you um, probably know, sections such as nomenclature is section 3.2.S1. Um, the manufacturer is section 3.2.S21, uh, et cetera. So just keep that in mind as I get to one of my later slides when I talk about using module 3 versus us using module 2 summaries. Um, so Many of you are probably familiar with NDAs, new drug applications, but here at the initial phase one um, stage, really this information that you provide is just at a more high level compared to what you would do at, at the NDA. So I've listed again here some minimum requirements, nomenclature, physical and chemical characteristics, where you're manufacturing, um, your method of preparation, but at this point you really just need a detailed flow diagram uh, listing your reagents and solvents and catalysts that you're, you're using, um, preliminary structure, justification. Um, really important for the FDA at this point is the discussion of your impurities, um, why the levels that you're seeing are, are safe, uh, specification with limits for ID, assay, and impurities, and anything else that might be important for your particular uh, drug substance. A very brief description of the analytical methods and really just a statement around the validation of those, of those methods. Detailed method validation is not needed at this point. Um, you should also include available batch analysis data, a uh, description of your container, and a brief description of the available stability data um, and any methods that you are using during stability if they're different um, from the release. So just some tips here to consider. Um, consider identification of your regulatory starting material. And I know Dan's going to go into this a little bit more, but say, for example, you have a 12-step synthesis. If, do we really want to put all 12 steps in the IND? You know, for example, is your step six material, is it um, qualified enough that you could use that as the starting material, and therefore we'd only uh, identify the last six steps um, of, the of the synthetic process in the IND? This just helps with maintaining the IND throughout the development. Um, also consider internal versus regulatory specification. So you may want to have, you may want to monitor, for example, a lot of residual solvents that, are, you're, that you're using way back early in the synthesis. But maybe in the IND we only call out uh, those residual, those solvents that you're using in the last step, just as an example. Again, this may help with life cycle management of the IND as you're going through development. Um, my next tip is to include the COA for the API that you use to prepare the first clinical lot. I've tried a number of times to not include this for timing reasons or other reasons, and we always are requested to include the COA. Um, another important um, piece here is to really focus on comparing the quality of your tox lot to the first lot that you're going to use in the first human clinical trial. So include, you know, what do your impurity profiles look like and how have you changed manufacturing between the tox lot and the um, first in human lot. Um, discuss potential genotoxic impurities. Again, this is a question that always comes back um, from the FDA if you haven't adequately addressed uh, this topic. And then just another point, in the U.S. there's really no need to specify your retest period for the API. Again, this helps you with um, maintaining the IND. Um, instead of needing to update the IND, you can do uh, retest extensions via your internal processes. So then if we move to uh, the drug product section, here I've just tried to illustrate that you may have a number of drug product sections. Um, you may be starting with an oral solution, uh, and that will have one 3-2-P section. You may eventually end up in phase three with a tablet formulation, and that will have its, its own 3-2-P section as well. Um, I've listed here, again, some of the minimum requirements. 
I'm running out of time, so I won't go through all of them. Um, but some tips here to consider, again, internal versus regulatory specifications. Um, include the COA for the first clinical lot. Uh, this has been, sometimes this is difficult because the, the company wants to get the IND in at a certain time to support a first in human date. And you may still be releasing your, your clinical lot and still dotting the I's and crossing the T's to be able to issue the COA. So if it's not included in the initial IND, 100% um, guarantee the FDA will ask for that COA. So just keep that in mind as you're preparing um, the IND. Um, and again, no need to specify the expiry period of your um, clinical trial material. You can do, you'll need to follow your internal procedures. Um, but so just ensure that the available stability data really supports the duration of, of the clinical use. Um, but no need to um, commit to that in the IND. I'll go through this slide very quickly. As you go get through development, you may have blinded comparators with similar requirements for what you need to provide. Um, again, include the COA for the first clinical lot. Uh, important to include the comparative dissolution information of your blinded versus your unblinded comparator. Um, and then you need to also state that the expiry will not um, extend beyond the labeled comparator expiry. You may also have blinded comparator placebos. So just to show you, you could have a number of 3-2-P sections um, in your IND. So module four, really quickly, this is where your non-clinical study reports are included. Uh, pharmacology studies, pharmacokinetic studies, your toxicology studies. And under toxicology here, I put some just basic, in general, the types of tox data that you need to open the IND. Um, some gene, there's a genotoxicity assessments that need to be completed, and then repeat dose toxicity studies. And the repeat dose toxicity studies, the, the requirement changes depending on how long your first clinical trial is. So if you're only dosing up to two weeks for your first trial, um, in rodents you need a two-week study, and in a non-rodent you also need a two-week study. But as you go through development and your clinical trials become longer and longer, you're going to need um, more repeat dose toxicity data. Uh, and then module five, this is where the protocols get submitted and, and eventually the clinical study reports. So remember I was talking about um, Module 2 summaries versus Module 3, and I'll just summarize this, this slide. Um, there's a resource consideration. When you're at early phase one, sometimes you're using a dosage form that won't continue through the development of the product. It's just to get an assessment of the safety of the product in humans. It's not, we're not necessarily going in with the final commercial tablet formulation. So, take advantage of an opportunity to include all of that information that I outlined as being part of Module 3, just put it in a Module 2 summary type of document. Uh, this is also how the EU does their um, CTAs or IMPDs, and, and so you'd be able to switch between those two um, types of applications more easily. Um, you may want to use Module 3 as you get closer to your commercial synthesis and your formulation, um, but at early phase one, when you're not even at your commercial dose, uh, it seems to make sense to use the module two summary approach just to make it easier on publishing, um, keeping track of information that belongs with um, an oral solution versus, versus a tablet. So there will be opportunity to ask questions um, at the end of the all three presentations. Um, so I, hopefully I can respond to any questions. But at this point, I think there is another quick poll question for the audience. Great. Thank you for that, Jennifer. And that is correct. We do have another quick poll question for the audience. And that should be launched on the audience's screen right now. And the poll question is, in which are you interested in? Our two answers are small molecules and biologics. So if the audience could please get their answers in right away. And also, I encourage the audience to keep sending in their questions for the Q&A session as well. 
So the question is, in which are you interested in? So small molecules or biologics? And it looks like majority of the audience has voted. So I will be closing the poll and sharing those results. So it looks like majority of the audience, 58%, voted for small molecules, while 42% voted for biologics. And now, without further ado, I will be passing over the presentation to Dan. You may begin when you're ready. Good morning, everybody. Hi, I'm Dan Weissmuller. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the drug substances. Um, I want to thank you for the introductions and thank everybody for coming, first of all. Um, a little bit of my background, I'm a chemist, so my background really is focused on those small molecules. Um, I'm going to have some themes that are going to pertain to the biologics as well, so it looks like 58% of you should be happy with this presentation. I'll try to do my best for the other 42. So a little bit of a preview. Uh, hey, Dan, sorry to cut in there. Uh, we just can't see your screen yet. It just hasn't clicked Perfect. over yet. Great. All right. So now everybody at home is following along. So to talk a little bit about the preview here, get that out of your way. Uh, I'm going to give you an introduction to pharmaceutical development. Uh, we're going to talk about the pipeline and really what the stages are along the way and what you're going to have to meet in order to get and make your IND successful. We're going to talk about some of the pre-planning that needs to be done. Uh, and again, this is all around the drug substance. We're going to take you to the starting point uh, for chemical manufacturing, and that's the tox batch, what you're going to use in your animal studies. We're going to work through phasing development and through the clinical process and how that affects your specifications, the materials you're using, your equipment and your processing, and your process itself. We'll talk along the way about quality systems and validation requirements. And then we're going to wrap it up uh, talking about some of the industry trends, things that are going on, uh, and how to manage those risks, uh, particularly in a contract manufacturing environment. So one of the things I do want to start off with before I move forward is that when developing pharmaceuticals, it's not just about the chemicals in the bottle. And I think Jennifer just spent 15 to 20 minutes talking about that, just that very fact. Uh, I'm a chemist in background, so, you know, I came into this industry thinking that I'm going to make the next drug and I'm going to put it in a bottle. And, you know, as soon as I made it and it got labeled, and I felt really excited about it. But it turns out that the paper is just as important as the product. And in fact, without one, the other has no value. And as I moved into quality and regulatory, I learned more and more about that. And so as we talk about this, one of the things just to consider is that sometimes this support work around the, uh, in pharmaceutical development will actually cost more, take more time, and requires a lot more effort and coordination. So uh, to all the chemists out there listening, yeah, well, you're important too, but uh, it's, it's really critical that you understand the milestones and all the different objectives and so the coordination effort, it's, it's really important. So let's talk about that. Um, this is the pharmaceutical pipeline. And you know, I'm sure in the internet and textbooks, there's dozens, if not hundreds, of different visual representations of this. So I took the pipeline and I condensed it down just to the sections that are relevant to an IND. So if, looking at this continuum, you see there's preclinical, then phase one, phase two, phase three. Before preclinical, there's a ton of work that leads up to finding your lead candidates. And then after phase three, there's a lot of work that happens in commercial, commercial support, pharmacovigilance, uh, phase four quality of life studies, and keeping things going. But we're going to focus here. And what I want to talk about here is how the, how the standards evolve and, and where you start and where you need to go in, in order to support your IND. So we start in the preclinical. Um, there is a guideline for this. This is, uh, this is actually before things become what is GMP, and that's good manufacturing practices, and that really becomes ultimately the standard that API, active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturers, need to meet. So uh, just to lead you to, and I have a reference slide at the end that can give you web links to a number of these, but there's a guidance for industry on the content and format and events to investigation of new drugs. And this isn't really manufacturing standards, but it kind of gives you a, a, a insight to what they're going to need to see in the IND, what Jennifer just spoke about, and helps you understand what you need to do in your drug development, but sort of what the minimum you need to have in your documentation, uh, which all translates to what you actually did in the lab. Once you cross this little line that you see between preclinical and phase one, you enter the land of GMP, good manufacturing practices. But it's not just that simple either. The GMPs are going to evolve. And there's two documents that really 
set the tone for what needs to be done for the drug substance. The first being this guidance for industry, the CGMPs for phase one investigational drugs. And then the second, which really takes place once you get into uh, human studies in phase two and phase three is ICHQ7, the good manufacturing practice guidance for active pharmaceutical ingredients. And even more interesting is that phase two is really only described in the last two pages of this document. And the other 20 to 30 pages are talking more about phase three and commercial. So as you work into this, uh, it's important to understand the whole cycle because you want to know what the end game is so that you can plan correctly. And at the beginning, it's really, really loose. So you want to have some sort of structure to your planning process. At the beginning, actually, the IND requirements are really quite simple. It's just a brief description of the manufacturing process. You have to include lists of all your materials, the reagents, solvents, catalysts to use. You're going to want to document your process, at least from a high-level flow. Um, you know, what's going into what. You, I'm sure you guys have seen these in, as far as blocks and arrows and pointing to what chemicals are inputs and outputs and making sure that's all defined. And you're going to have just sufficient development around this process in order to remove harmful impurities. And Jennifer talked a little bit about this, is that there's going to be a review of all the chemicals that go in and the chemical that's coming out. So you have the API that you're making, and you have all the raw materials and starving materials, and the FDA is going to take a look at those. On the drug that you're making, well, we're not quite sure what's going to happen there. That's what the point of the IND is. We're going to figure that out. But the raw materials and intermediates, there may be data out there already. Uh, so what the FDA and what you should be doing to prepare for that is going to do is they're going to look at those materials. They're going to look at their MSDSs. They're going to use modeling softwares like Derek uh, to see if they're potentially gene toxic. They're, uh, they perhaps might bring toxicologists involved. And they're going to try to predict how dangerous those are. And some of them are well documented. Uh, an example of that is lead. I mean, there's, there's data going back to the Roman aqueducts as far as how hazardous that can be. Uh, other examples might be solvents. Things are chlorinated like chloroform or methylene chloride, benzene, carbon tetrachloride. There is data out there. And the FDA is going to use it, and you should be aware of it too. Take a look at that. Try to remove whatever you can from your process that's known to be harmful. Uh, try to, and, and if you can't remove it, you're going to want to quantify it and you're going to have some data around that so that you don't set up your study for failure. It's, it would really be a shame if that the outcome, whether it's either positive or negative, was dependent on an impurity and not the product you were actually trying to make. One of the second points here, though, is that having enough material to do a study, and that's both preclinical and for clinical. Th this is a big change once you hit this stage. This is where your units of measure in, that you have planned in your mind really need to ha have a quantum change. This is where you start thinking kilograms. Uh, and this is important because it's not just about what you need to use for the study. You're going to want to contact your CROs, whoever's doing the animal studies, whoever's going to be doing the early phase uh, human studies. Find out exactly how much they, material they need, but it goes well beyond that. As we test and prove the safety of these products, uh, there's, there's a lot of analysis that needs to be done. It takes considerable amounts of material. Um, on top of that, there's a requirement once you become GMP that you have to retain a certain amount of material, typically three times the testing that you did or more. Then there's going to be a requirement for stability potentially. That means you have to take that amount that you were going to test and you need to package it into little bottles and vials that min uh, mimic what you're going to put onto a shelf. And then you simulate the shelf life and and test, test, test. And then you might want to use this material as a reference, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, because your early manufacturing becomes the benchmark for safety for your later manufacturing. And anything that's new or different needs to be justified. So often it's, this material can be used as a reference. Furthermore, you might want to do formulation studies. You might want to do some, or some other polymorph, any, any type of scientific evaluation of the material. You'd need a quantity to do that. So all that being said, you might be at about a half a kilogram before you can even get into your preclinical. It's just something to consider. And your process, has to be, your process has to be safe, too. So when you look at your materials, it's not just about what you're willing to put into the animals and the people, but you want to make sure that your, your manufacturing equipment can safely process that as well. So that takes us to the tox batch. The tox batch is the material you intend to use in your animal studies. It's, 
it's the manufacturing, it's the API that you're going to put into the, into the animals. The tox batch is often referred to as a GLP batch. That's actually an industry slang. GLP doesn't apply to the manufacturing. It, it's more of a set a, of laws and regulations that govern the animal studies themselves. But what we need to be here is a well-characterized material, well understood. It's a lot of analysis as opposed to testing. Uh, it sets the baseline for quality because once you've gone into the animal studies and you've shown that this material is in fact suitable enough that you would give it to a person, it has to be that good or better. So it, it needs to be well documented. That's important because if you didn't document how you made the first batch, it's going to be really hard to repeat that process. Um, and actually some are starting to extend this to manufacture under a quality system. And that can be a little confusing to some. And what we're starting to see more and more from GLP laboratories is they might want to see an ISO certification for whomever's manufacturing the GLP or TOX batch, uh, or even uh, GMP types of operations. So as the drug substance is moving through this pharmaceutical pipeline, the requirements evolve, and so do the specifications. We talked about the tox batch. We talked about how that's developing a safety profile. You're collecting as much information you can around the impurities that are in that material so that you can understand your risks and manage them. Uh, you're talking, to, you want a well-characterized material. You want to understand it as much as that's reasonably possible. You're not going to know what all your impurities are, but you at least want to know how much of them there are so that if you have a reasonably pure material and you, uh, and you know what's representative of your process, you can repeat that and you have that benchmark to know that it's better or not. Uh, Pass-fail specifications may not be appropriate at this time. This goes to what Jennifer was talking about as far as internal versus regulatory specifications. Early in development, it'd be cautious about painting yourself into a box. You're learning. A lot of this is discussion. A lot of this is investigation. Uh, you really want to let the data drive the day. And if you're not sure, uh, you really should uh, be very careful about putting a limit on something you, you don't know if you can control. At phase one, specifications are going to be set to demonstrate equivalence to the safety profile, the tox batch. Any changes need to be uh, qualified. So if you see impurities that are now at higher levels, you, you may need to go back and perform additional animal studies before you're prepared to move into give this drug to people. Uh, reference standards are typically in place to do this. Uh, and at this point, there might be some pass-fail specifications, especially for the things that are well-defined and understood, the solvents, the reagents, the raw materials, anything that's potentially identified as, a, as genotoxic. At phase two, these specifications are going to advance. Uh, now we're actually going to start having more concrete specifications. As you're going into dosing studies, which is happening at this time, you're going to know how much material. So now you can start to quantify these impurities and, ex and know exactly how much can be in your drug substance. And then at phase three, of course, everything's going to be validated. You're ready to run commercial. You should know your process. The end game is in mind, and you know how to get there. Uh, here's some examples just put out onto a slide of things that you would typically look for uh, and put onto a C of A. Appearance, identification, related substances, and that's typically an HPLC assay looking for compounds that are either intermediates, the raw materials, or byproducts. Uh, you're going to look for your moisture content. Is it dry? Uh, is, there, is there residual water or solvents left from manufacturing? Inorganic impurities such as metals, uh, cadmium, arsenic, lead, mercury, and anything else you might have used in processing. Counter ion testing. Uh, is this a salt? Uh, if it's going to be, and then also your route of administration is going to have some impact. You might want to take some do some work. But Steve's going to talk about this in a lot more detail. Uh, but this is just really an introduction. It all go back, it goes back to the starting material. It's really, this is one of the questions I hear a lot. So where does this all begin? And, and starting material is sort of a hard thing to understand. Um, you know, I even hear the chemists debate this quite a bit. But the definition in ICHQ11 is a raw material intermediate or API that is used in the production of an API that has incorporated a significant structural fragment into the structure of that API. It can be article of commerce, material purchased, custom manufactured, you name it. The way I like to think of this, and I'm going to actually get it, if everybody can put their hands in front of them right now, put your keyboards down and hold out your two hands, spread your fingers out, and you look at each of your hands, and each one of those is a raw material, and each one of those by themselves is not pharmaceutically active, and that's key. Touch thumbs. Now you've made your core molecule. That now is pharmaceutically active. That is an intermediate. Two hands by themselves, starting materials, 
touched the thumbs, now it's pharmaceutically active, that's an intermediate. Or even the API. Now look at your fingers, and if you wiggle your pinky finger, it's not really a significant fragment, it's something you added on, that may not constitute as a starting material. Uh, examples of this in chemistry might be if you do a, a, an esterification and you add ethanol onto a, a structure that's already pharmaceutical, pharmaceutically active, that's that, that doesn't count, and the FDA gives you a wave on that one. So when we talk about API starting materials, these are, these are under high scrutiny, these are important to understand, uh, but they are significant fragments, and they in themselves are typically not active chemicals unless you're using an already approved API as your starting material. So uh, surveillance, reputation, and uh, is really the way you, you qualify these. Early on in phase one, you're gonna be looking at the reputation of suppliers, passing their certificate of analysis, and then use test, use test, use test. You really don't know what the specs need to be, so you kind of really the best way to prove it is to try it out. As you start moving into clinical development, uh, you're going to be looking for repeatability of the material. Is it consistently meeting specification? Are you going to start to develop specifications based on your experience in the lab, seeing what impurities carry through? But really, you should only be setting specs internally based on the data, things that you're seeing. Um, and again, another opportunity to keep regulatory specifications and internal specifications separate. At phase three commercial, you are going to have set specs. You're going to have a comprehensive auditing program. It's, uh, these are going to be the expectations. And I'm just going to throw in there now, quality agreement. Uh, if you haven't talked to your local FDA compliance folks recently, quality agreements, quality agreements, quality agreements. They're looking for them. So be prepared. Get your legal teams. They, they should have them. Uh, moving along, equipment qualification. This is actually a pretty easy one because along this whole part, you need to do it. Uh, analytical equipment, you need to be able to trust your numbers. That's from that initial C of A that you're putting into your first IND all the way through into commercial development. Whatever the numbers are, you need to be able to trust them. You need to know that the uh, equipment that you're using is accurate. It's a little bit different for process equipment. For process equipment, you're not going to take it through full uh, validation at the very beginning. You're going to design it, you're going to install it, you're going to prove that it works, but uh, through the development process, you're going to continue to increase scale. You're going to continue to change and make modifications to your process. So you're not going to show that the reproducibility of your actual process works until you know that you've hit your endpoint. And that takes us that what the whole point of this is, and that is process validation. That's the goal. As you're approaching phase three in commercial, uh, process validation is required. And, but it's not something you just flip the switch at phase three commercial. It's something you've been working on all along the way. Uh, critical process parameters are gonna be identified and challenged. These are, these are steps in the reaction. Um, imagine baking a cake. If you set it to 350, like the recipe says, everything should work out. But what if your oven's really at 305 or 325? How far off the mark can you be? It, this, this includes how much materials you use, uh, temperatures, times, et cetera. Uh, process changes are going to be required for both for worker safety, patient safety, and scale. Those are all interrelated, uh, so something you have to be mindful for. Engineering requirements and qualification develop with scale as well. Um, there are quality by design approaches that you should be evaluating and considering whether that's the right option for you. It might take a higher investment earlier on in uh, the design, but the quality benefits for lead candidates can really pay off. Um, and then analytical methods get developed and needed as uh, validated throughout the process. Uh, validation usually starts kicking in at phase one for critical methods, maybe a release test or two. Uh, at, fa at phase two, you'll see the validation for uh, most of the release tests in place, but by phase three, throughout the process, uh, you should be validating your analytical. And all of these different activities that you've been doing along the way all need to be documented because in our world, if it wasn't documented, it didn't happen. And the folks in regulatory are going to have to take all this information, all this complicated work that I've been simplifying all along the way here, and put it into a regulatory submission, into the IND. And how they're going to do that is they're going to look through process development reports, completed batch records, engineering reports, analytical development and validation reports, certificates of analysis, stability testing. These are all important reports. They all need to be written. They need to be written at each batch, at each milestone, so that people can take that information and get it in where it needs to go. Um, finally, just some of the industry tricks uh, and trends to be aware of. Global outsourcing. Uh, we, 
everybody's seem to be going this route, one of the things you want to be looking for, uh, look at people's FDA record, years of service, making sure that they've done this before. Uh, make sure that they're stage appropriate. Make sure that uh, if you're, you're looking to use someone, they don't typically only serve as GLP, uh, toxicology batches in phase one. That they, if, if you're looking to go commercial with these as well, that they've been there before, it's a, it's a lot different uh, as far as setting up quality standards. Uh, make sure you're at the right shop. Uh, the biologics folks know that it's not the same factory as it is the small molecules, and the small molecule folks know it's not the same factories for the biologics. Uh, don't take your API to be made at a, somewhere where they just do formulation. Find somebody with an area of expertise. Um, quality agreements, just going to say it again because it's a hot button right now. And stay within reach. Be realistic of the human conditions. Uh, it, it's difficult to communicate across barriers like language, oceans, regulatory, um, making sure that you've got the right people to get your materials through customs. Different companies from different sizes are going to benefit more or less from uh, taking in the advantages of, of, of our global market here. So just make sure you understand those, look into them. Uh, it's pretty complex. One of the other trends to look out for is potent and orphan development. Now, we're not talking about orphan INDs. It, everything is sort of a different pathway for that. It's, it's, it's quicker, and these are for uh, neglected diseases. But 40% of the drug approvals from last year uh, were potent, and, and that's a trend that's been ongoing and continuing. Just make sure that you're aware of that when you're looking at your contract manufacturers. Uh, make sure you're looking at that when you're placing your products because uh, it's out there. If, if most of the drugs being targeted are potent and these drugs can impact your clinical results, you need to know what your factories are working on so that you know your risks and you can plan accordingly. Um, it's a scary reality, and someone else's candidate could fail yours. So. All right. So uh, just moving along, I've got references. I think you guys are going to receive slides, so you'll see these. And I think there's going to be a poll question. So good luck with that answer. All right, guys, take care. Hi, thanks for that, Dan. Actually, we're going to pass it over straight to Steve, just because we are a little short on time. So Steve, whenever you are ready. All right, we'll talk the uh, last few minutes here on um, drug product considerations. Um, and Dan has covered a lot of this, and so has Jennifer as they've gone through their process and their, their, their presentations here. Um, but uh, let's talk about a few things here. We'll talk a little bit about dosage form, um, hit a little bit more on container closure systems. I'll, I'll spend a few slides on analytical methods and their validation, and we'll talk about uh, specifications and, and stability, which uh, stability is very critical throughout the entire process. Dosage forms, uh, obviously, depending on your drug, what its mechanism is, how it works, um, how well absorbed it is, you could be in a variety of different, different dosage forms. Many compounds, especially small molecules and, uh, and bio biologics as well, will start out as an IV formulation. It, it's the simplest way to get a drug into the body, although it has, from a drug product, point uh, its own issues. Um, many times it could be as simple as taking a sterile API, putting it in a vial that can be reconstituted before it's being used and then injected into the patient. Um, the, for IV formulations, sterility is the key. It's, it's obviously very important as you're injecting something into, uh, into somebody's body. If you can't use API in a bottle, the next choice is typically lyophilization. Uh, there are this out there um, that you can do it at fairly quickly and easily at a small scale and you reconstitute the product before uh, before the next use. Inhalation uh, dosage forms are more complicated and becoming more prevalent because it is another great way to get your drug into the body. If you can get the drug into the lungs and it can be absorbed there, it gets very quickly into the into the system. So, from a uh, from a bio, biological point, this is something that's very attractive. From a product point, it's very key uh, in terms of particle size. There's only a certain size particle that will be inhaled into the lung and then absorbed into the system. So. Um, Controlling that becomes very key for an inhalation product, and it becomes very dilute. You can't really, you know, slug this at somebody. They, it's not going to go into the lungs if you do that. So it tends to take a little while to uh, to be dosed. 
um, from a product point, from from um, a product development point, being an oral formulation is easy, easier because you know you've you, you've got a lot less controls there because you're taking it through uh, you know through the mouth. Many times in phase one, you will start with just putting the API into a hard shell uh, capsule with no excipients, and the patient will follow it and it'll get absorbed into the system. Uh, many times though more elaborate formulation may be necessary to be able to get the API so it can be absorbed into the system. Drug product container, container closure uh, is definitely something uh, Jennifer mentioned this needs to be part of the IND for both the drug substance and the drug product. Um, for sterile products it becomes even more critical as you're looking at validation of that closure system. If you make it sterile, package it sterile, it has to maintain that sterility until it's being used in the patient. Um, you're going to have to do some kind of justification for the container closure system, but it could be a paper evaluation. You know, yes, we've used this vial and this stopper in the past and they've worked together and the product is going to impact it. As you get further into uh, the NDA stage, further into development in NDA, that's going to change and you're going to have to do a lot more justification. Analytical methods. Um, many times uh, you're going to use the API method with some adaptation for the formulation sample. Um, they typically tend to be HPLCs and this is what's going to be used for um, the assay and impurities, it's the first assay that people are looking at. Uh, and again, you can use the same method uh, for both the drug product and drug substance. Process impurities need to be detectable by the method, um, and, and that's going to be very important, but those detection levels are going to be higher now than they will be as you approach uh, NDA. The impurity profile needs to be evaluated against the tox batch, um, and one of the the tox batches, it's been mentioned, are defining the upper allowable limits for impurities. Um, many times companies will end up doing their tox lots on very clean material and then that sets the benchmark very low going forward because you have to have that clean of material going forward. Um, and and it's, it's one of those things, it's, it's hard to uh, instill that, no, I want a dirty batch for tox and I'll clean it up further down the road. That's the ideal. Um, for IV and inhalation products, sterility and bio burden are going to be key as, as well as endotoxin and really uh, the key thing throughout the process, but especially at phase one, um, patient safety is paramount. You may not know if the drug works, but you, you've got to take these steps to make sure the patient is safe. Analytical method validation uh, at IND level is typically going to be, well, will be much less. You'll do precision, accuracy, specification, linearity. You'll do the basic things to make sure the method works and it's giving you valid numbers. Uh, and it needs to be sufficient to support whatever your specification is. You're not going to do things like robustness at this point. Uh, and robustness really means you, you can take this method and any trained analyst should be able to run it and get the same result. That's not something you're doing at phase one. It may be very specific to an instrument and to an analyst, uh, and later you'll make it robust. Impurity analysis uh, is not really going to be well developed at phase one. Uh, typically, you're going to be looking at uh, an area percent calculation on an HPLC curve. Um, later on, you will actually be identifying impurities and putting response factors to them so that uh, you don't assume that everything responds the same as the main peak. But uh, that's a future consideration as you get into phase two and phase three. Specifications um, need to be sufficient to characterize the compound. You do not need to get to uh, um, ICH Q6A and Q6B levels uh, in the early clinical phase. Those guidance documents tell you how to set specifications and levels, but they also specifically say that they are for commercial products. You're going to look at assay and potency uh, for your drug products. Uh, you know, a standard assay limit is 90 to 110 uh, percent at this phase in particular, and then you will tighten it up as you go. Impurities, typically, uh, they're going to. Uh, fairly high levels of impurities are allowed depending on what your total dose is, but you do need to understand the toxicity of those impurities to make sure that they don't have a unique toxicity that you need to take better control on. 
Uh, many of the impurities won't be identified or characterized at this point. Stability, you're going to have to do stability. Um, Jennifer mentioned um, C of A's for the clinical material. You also need stability data to show um, on the drug product that you are stable. In the U.S., you need to submit with the NDA a month of uh, drug product and drug substance data at least. Europe is requiring three months. Really, uh, as was mentioned, you need to show that the product is stable throughout the entire period, and you will be monitoring this um, for pretty much every batch that you're going to make. Uh, typically, ICHQ1A are the test conditions. They're pretty standard, um, and they really give you a good read of stability. You will be wanting to look at uh, accelerated conditions as well. And again, Jennifer mentioned that you need to have the stability needs to be sufficient to cover the time that the product's going to be in the clinic. It'll be concurrent. You need to have some idea of whether your product is stable or not. And as important, it needs to be conducted in whatever package you're going to be giving to the clinic and the patient. And I think with that, I will turn it back to Vicki. Well, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. Now, I would like to invite our audience to continue sending in their questions for the Q&A portion of the webinar. And we have received a ton of questions, so we will get started with those. So the first question we have here is for Jennifer. So I'm not too sure about the Module 2 slash 3 approach, since Module 2 is intended as a summary of the information in Module 3. For an IND, I only submit a Module 3 for quality and update as needed. Can you please comment on your approach? So Jennifer, let me know if you need me to repeat any of that. Okay, yeah, so the um, Module 2 versus Module 3 approach, I will say that um, in my early years, I used only the Module 3 approach, and I really like that approach. Um, if you are going into your first studies with a close to commercial formulation, if you're going in with tablets and you have quite a bit of information that you want to provide to the FDA, um, that seems like a better format and I would agree with that. If you are opening your IND with a drug in bottle, um, maybe an IV formulation that you are only going to study in this one clinical study and you're not going to be updating information for the drug in bottle or the IV formulation. It seems to make sense uh, that you would just do a module two approach. So you wouldn't have any module three information. So you would have, you know, at phase one, you might have one page for each of these individual module three documents. So it's, it saves, even though there's the same amount of information, it's just combined into one file and it's easier for the publishers to publish and it kind of keeps all the information that is specific to the drug and bottle or um, the IV formulation into one packet. Um, again, you're, if you're not going to be using that formulation going forward, you, you are not going to be updating your way you formulate the drug and bottle or your specification for the drug and bottle. It's going to stop at that point. Um, you know, for the drug substance section, you could use a, you could use the module three approach because you, you probably will be making some changes to your synthetic scheme, to the solvents that you're using, and if you want to just update, you know, the method of manufacture section instead of an entire module two, um, I could agree with that. It, this approach is really just to try to save some effort. Um, early in development when you're not even sure if this compound is going to move much past phase one or phase two. I hope that answers the question. Thank you for that. So we just have time for maybe one more question, and that question is for Steve. How can you assess impurity toxic toxicity in the absence of ID information? Thanks for that question. Um, you know, during your your synthetic development, your, your 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 chemists are going to understand how this product degrades. I mean, it's going to be part of that process. They're going to be going through that throughout that time, so they will have some idea of what the impurities could be. Um, so while you may not analytically identify them, which involves a very specific set of of requirements, 
um, you will know what they are. You will, you will probably have synthesized them. You can also be looking at these. There are certain structural elements that will indicate um, genotoxicity, especially as you're dealing with some of the um, the, the chlorinated compounds that you will really you will want to specifically take a look at. A good industrial toxicologist can can take a look at a molecule and tell you that there are things called structural alerts, and those might be in your impurities and would require you to actually go back and do some toxicology on them to to determine whether they're an issue or not. So analytical identification is different than understanding that there are impurities out there that could have unique toxicities. Well, thank you very much. Actually, uh, Vicki, this is Dan. I just want to throw one more thing in there, too. No and, problem. Well, Steve's right. There's a lot of work as far as identifying impurities based on what's known. There are also guidelines for what levels of impurities you need to chase after. Uh, I think it's ICHQ3, and that is part of the development process to just some more, just some more background as to when you need to go do the work to get the MS and the NMR and try to isolate and identify these things. Thank you very much for those answers. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of the Q&A portion of this webinar. If you do have any further questions, please direct them to the email addresses showing on your screen. And thank you everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up shortly on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speakers for today, Jennifer Stanick, Dan Westmuller, and Steve Pondell. We hope you have found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.